All right, in this episode, we've got Dylan Sicoccio back to talk about his book series, Spirit World, particularly the fourth book in that series. We had him on here, I think at the beginning of the year to talk about Get Mad or Get Realistic, and now he's finished his fourth book, working on the fifth in this series, and I highly, highly recommend it. All the links to it are in the description. I highly recommend you go down and check it out. It's been instrumental in my life to understand a lot of the different concepts that we're talking about here, but really, I just wanna get right into it because it's a long one, and I think it's really, really important. So check out the links in the description for all his stuff and how to find me and support the show. But with all that, let's get into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show today. I'm really excited. I'm always really excited to talk to this guy. We have author of Spirit World. He was on the last episode. He was on with us was Get Mad or Get Realistic. He's an author, friend, someone who I am really appreciative of even starting this podcast and finally reaching out to people and meeting them. And now people that I look up to and really, really idolize their work or really, you know, uh, draw a lot of inspiration from are now people that are just in my phone and I can talk to whenever I want. So I have with me author of Spirit World. We're going to talk about book four, God's Acre for Winds of the Soul. Dylan Sicoccio, how are you doing today, sir? I'm fired up, man. And I'm really resisting the urge not to like talk like Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh, yeah! Because we're going to be talking about all exciting history and stuff that nobody in this space has the balls or the knowledge to talk about it. And uh, that's why you have me on, because I don't mind breaking down barriers and getting the truth out there. And thank you for the kind words. And it's an honor that you're in my life as well. And for the audience, you know, Rob is a go-getter. It's why I do his show. He is not someone that sits around and commiserates or like, you know, whines about his problems. He is always looking for solutions and he's always looking for win-win situations where him and his friends can grow and profit off of and not cause any harm to others. So you're a great guy and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, I appreciate it, man. I, I'm really curious as to, I mean, I've read your books obviously, and I'd say that they're, that you have to meet them where they're at in terms of like, you don't, you don't pull any punches and you dive right into things and everything like that. What I was so fascinated by when I first learned about your work through Crow and I started to pick up Spirit World, the reason why was because you took a very, I think, specific and uh, an approach that a lot of people I, I knew in the space weren't going down when they decode certain things like the Bible, things like these older texts, things like religion, all that kind of stuff. And you went specifically through the language or through the language of language. And I was wondering to just kind of kick us off for people who might not know your work in terms of the Spirit World series. Why is it that you went through that? And why do you think that's so important to do? Um, well, I I started getting more into language um, when I started the further back in history. And there's a lot of people like religious scholars, priests themselves. And when you start reading the work of even some of the most prominent, powerful um, priests, you end up seeing that there is an expectation that people know certain languages and roots. And you, what you will see is they have a skill set, and that skill set is to create alphabets based on the same system. And then they create words, and those words will take different meanings based on the culture, but they will often be the same roots rehashed or re remixed around, and they have a similar system of how they create words based on natural things that they observe. And when you start getting into this, you'll see that there is a system and it's not coincidence. And I think the biggest challenge we have is because people are so ignorant of language, they don't see how it interchanges. They are unable to look at the patterns. Um, I had a gentleman the other day on Instagram who I just banned because I don't tolerate when people speak to me like this, but he was basically making a mockery of a, a an example I use to show philologically how the root of the word serpent and the root of the word salvatore, which is savior in Latin, are the exact same root dressed up differently. And so somebody who's not familiar with this will say, oh, you're just doing what you want to do and interchanging whatever letters you want to interchange. But what they don't recognize is that if you understand language in different cultures, 
as far back as you can see, you can trace where the people started interchanging letters and started using them differently. And why, like if you were to look at the word, um, I just share, shared something on my YouTube the other day, uh, just to show people like a, a few hundred years ago, the D in certain words was used like a TH, like instead of burden, it would be burthen. So the T, the D, the TH, the S and the T are interchangeable. The, this goes back to the Greek world, the sigma tau, ST, that's interchange. We even still say it today, listen. We don't say listen, we say listen, you know? And we don't say mistletoe, we say mistletoe. <laughs> so you see how these are all written indiscriminately. And by knowing this, you can know how people are dressing up words. And when you have a, a specific society or cult and the expert use of language and symbolism is what they do. And that's the advantage they maintain. And there is a, in fact, a system and it is a rigid system. Anybody wants to see how rigid the system is, go read the Justinian code. You get caught selling or wearing Syrian purple and you're not in the, the ruling class, the punishment was death. That's not airy fairy, yes and. That is, you do this and we will end your life to send a message to anybody else who's thinking about using these symbols. This is ours, right? So there's this exists as far back as you can see. And the only way you're ever going to get to the truth of the matter is language, because that's the last place where it can't be destroyed if you know its origins and if you know what certain roots and radicals mean and what certain prefixes and suffix means. And by knowing a language and how language works, you can unlock a culture's history in places where artifacts, where architecture, uh, everything else fails. Right. Yeah. I just even even more colloquially too is uh, later. I'll, I'll talk to you later. You know, you know, you're not saying later. Even just in our own language. And I was also thinking too, you can trace these things back, like you said, at certain times, like when people started using the word "sick" to mean good. Right. Like th that's kind of. It's, a, it's almost like a definite place in a certain culture at a certain Bro, point. that's sick. Oh my right. God, bro. That kickflip was fucking disgusting. Right, yes. But it also, it also means that like, it, it's not like these things are unique and they just came about in our age. It's like what you're showing with your work is like, this is actually, it's nothing new. And it's actually like stuff that you can apply to today to sort of hopefully open your mind to read these things in, in context and then decipher them the way that you do. Yes. And so there's different ways language changes, whether that's through the vernacular, kind of like what you were saying, like where people do it themselves. And then there's the way things are set up um, by a priest class, you know, they'll get improved by grammarians, et cetera. And so language will take on a life of its own. And that's why it'll change over time. And that's why your ability to recognize what the changes are and what the different meanings are throughout history will help you get back to the original uh, idea laid up in a word. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to, I wanted to lay that groundwork for people who may be new to your work or new to your, you just in general, um, because I thought it was really, it was a very unique way of going about it. And it, I mean, you read some of your, your work and you're kind of like, this is sort of, this is pretty undeniable. Like the way that you can kind of break this down, you're like, I don't know how you can kind of argue with this in terms of like, yeah, there's something seriously kind of up with the way that this has been hidden in plain sight. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's a little frustrating because I can see like how many people continue the journey or like what percentage of sales and, you know, the first book and the second book, those are more alchemical texts to get you to think about certain things differently, to kind of hold up a mirror and show you how we are all hypocrites. We are all suffering to a degree of the lower nature, which is based in um, self-preservation and moral relativism. And the idea is to transcend that as much as possible, right? With causing the least amount of harm as possible, but ultimately not destroying yourself and not acting high and mighty on it because every single person, no matter how spiritually uh, attuned they think they are, they cause harm in this world because this world is based on creation and destruction. And in that is the preservation of the system. And so the first two books are kind of alchemical. The second book is gonna show you how this ties into the modern system enslaving you and where it goes back to specifically with the Vatican and the papal bulls. And it's gonna, expose uh, more astrotheology, 
And then where my work really starts excelling and taking off is with book three and this one, book four. And, um, you know, people have said this is their favorite one, but you need the, uh, you need the framework of the prior books because it's like, it's going to bring everything full circle. And um, so I highly encourage people, you know, the first two books are kind of controversial and they might trigger the reader, but the books get more advanced and more enjoyable and more like uplifting as they go along and less conspiracy oriented where now we're just dealing with mythology and symbolism and a little bit of history versus, you know, all the sensational content regarding the control systems that are, um, have basically created this illusion of authority based on fictional characters. And if you don't know how to defeat the presumption of what they are saying their authority is derived from, then you're forced to submit to that. And that's what's basically happened. And this ties all the way back to Asia. And that's what um, people will really start seeing in book five that's about to be released uh, later this year, Q Q4, definitely. And um, it's called The Holy Sailors. And it's going to explore this even further to show you how far back feudalism goes, um, all this stuff, because it, it basically all goes to Asia, monarchies, kings, all that stuff was not natural to Europe before that Asian influence came here. So uh, it's about time to get back uh, to freedom and, uh, you know, some semblance of sovereignty. Right? We're always going to have some framework of laws or a legal code we agree to for a society. But the idea is nobody has a right to dictate their whims to you, right? And so it's like, who has the right to make those laws in nature? They don't. So we have to come to some sort of balance where we are not so eager to give up our authority to somebody else. Because even if they have the best interests in mind, another person can't represent you. Only you can present yourself in the the real world. Right. Yeah. We've covered a couple of those uh, topics on this, this show as well. So people will get what we're talking about here to a certain extent, hopefully. Um, I was going to say when you were saying that, that the first two books really do have that framework and it's interesting reading the, the, the third and fourth, especially the fourth. I was like, Oh yeah, I, I, um, I had to highlight like crazy over the first two. Um, and then I was about to say, I didn't have to do so much in the fourth. And then I just remembered in my mind, I was like, yeah, actually no, the whole thing's, the whole thing's highlighted, but I understand what you're saying. Like, it's almost like I don't need the, um, the long explanations or whatever anymore. It's almost like, okay, I see where you're going, where you're going with that word. Perfect. But I mean, like the breakdowns are still, you know, all highlighted and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just amazing stuff. And, um, I know you, you, uh, you prepared something today for what we've got for our listeners. Um, which I really appreciate. And I was wondering if you want to just dive right into that. Yeah, let's dive in because this is going to be a, a lengthy um, history lesson. And it's something that most people are totally ignorant about, especially in the uh, these spaces. And we're going to talk about the early Christian church. And the reason we're going to talk about that is because one of the things that is like rampant in these spaces is this denial. So people will constantly say like, well, that, yeah, I know that's happening under the guise of Christianity, but that's not real Christianity. You know what I mean? And we're going to dispel this once and for all because it needs to be dispelled. And it's not uh, anything against Christians or Christianity. It's going to be an uh, unemotional, masculine take on Christianity that's indisputable because I use the greatest Christian minds to come to this and I use their own work and everyone else could do that if they weren't ignorant of language. And one of the great things about going through spirit worlds, by the time you get through book four, if you're actually looking this stuff up, if you're doing like the couple minutes that it takes, you know, maybe like a day, if you just look at some of these alphabets and learn like the Hebrew alphabet, learn the Greek alphabet. If you're copying, pasting or writing stuff, you're eventually going to learn these alphabets. And then once you can learn those alphabets, you'll get to be able to understand Phoenician. You'll be able to look at something on a wall carved from thousands of years ago or a tablet, and you'll be able to see, oh, that Phoenician D looks like the Delta in Greek or the Phoenician, you know, Mem looks like a similar, you know, it, it looks like the sign of Virgo. You know, and you'll be able to see, but it's like got the same name as like a Hebrew. And you can see how all these languages go back to this old, old language uh, that would be Phoenician, Etruscan, 
and I've talked about this on other podcasts, but there is a, an origin of this current system. What's beyond that? There's no telling because we don't have the, we don't have the, uh, like, I don't know if languages were even written down before that, or if they were, the artifacts don't survive because they were written on perishable things like bark and whatever else, you know, natural things. But as far back as we can tell when they were carving stuff in stone, there is an origin and this system is universal. And that's what they're hiding, in my opinion. That's what my latest book's going to further um, explore is there is a hidden universal system. And if this weren't the case, you wouldn't have people in Mexico speaking a different dialect of Hebrew and having the same mythoses as Christians and Jewish mythoses, but together as one story. Yet they didn't have the use of letters and they didn't have the ability to smell iron or mine it, despite having mountains rich in iron. And had any of this shit been brought by Europeans, they would have brought with them the use of letters, the ability to smell iron and make harder tools. Instead, what they found is they have all this stuff and they're using spears made from cane. And the way that the Jesuits and stuff covered this up is they said, oh, the reason they speak uh, corrupt Hebrew is because they're of the devil. But the real reason they had to destroy all these people and their history is because it totally debunks the Mosaic history, which the church and all these other institutions, doesn't matter if it's the first king of Britain, he's claimed to be a descendant of Noah. But there was no Noah. There's no Japet. There's no Shem. There's no Ham. These are all allegories for different portions of the year, and Noah would be the sun, same as Brahm, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, right? You see this in everywhere. And this system is universal. I can prove it in multiple languages. If For those who want to go deep into it, read Spirit World. But today we're going to get into the church, and let's get it going. You ready? I'm ready, man. I'm stoked. This is uh, quite the introduction there. Perfect. Well, so in the primitive, a lot of, a lot of uh, terms that are like sensational terms, at least over the past like 20 years, one of them was the Illuminati, right? And you always hear people talk about this and they existed. And then you hear this, well, they were only the Bavarian Illuminati. And they try to minimize how old, the, how young that is. And I'm here to say nonsense, wrong. The Illuminati goes back and is as old as the early Christian church because it is Christian. And so in the primitive church, there were three classes of Christians. There were the catechumens, there were the competentes, and then the Illuminati. And so the Illuminati were also called misty or the faithful. And this term is given as a title to the initiated of the Orphic and the Eleusinian mysteries. Now, Eleusinian uh, comes from uh, an etymology meaning the sons of Elios, right? Enos, Elios, right? So Orphic is the uh, Orpheus, not a real person, an archetype, but the Orphic tradition comes from India and they brought the Trinity to the Christians and or to the mystery schools in the Mediterranean, which found its way into the Christian church because the Christian church was all started by people who were members of the mystery schools. And we're going to get into that. Now, the scriptures were the common possession of all Christians, but the Illuminati of the Orthodox Gnosticism were supposed to read them in meanings indiscernible to the vulgar eye. And so going back to what I was saying about mosaic history, Moses is another name for the initiates and the physical and metaphysical symbolism of the Nile. So this is why when people, you hear people say like, well, what if God's water? And you've been seeing this like theme that pops up and everybody kind of just parrots themselves and repeats everything. But this goes back to the old world and you can look up how many times Jesus refers himself as the living waters, right? And so that is what's included in Moses, right? And so you have the living waters of the Christos, the Christ and the bishops thereof, which would be Serapis. Now, Augustine wrote, we come down to Moses, the ocean of theology out of which all rivers and seas flow. This is an initiate telling you 
about where everything comes from in regards to this system. Now, before we started recording, we were talking about some of the interchangeabilities of letters and stuff, but in Hebrew and Greek, the E and the H are interchangeable. The word Moses, if you were to transliterate it, it would look like M-S-E. It would be Mem Shin He. And it's pronounced Moshe. Now, it doesn't differ from the word to anoint, other than the fact that it's pronounced differently and they, they switch the He with a Chet. And so that makes it become Moshach. But it's still going to look like M-S-H, right? So M-S-E, M-S-H. But the E and the H, or the He and the uh, the Ada in Greek, they're all they're, it's a, it's got a dual use, and so as a noun, Moshach M S H means oil, which is a liquid named after water, which is named after life, which is named after the sun, which is ultimately named after God, and so this is the same with Jesus, as I H S is also I E S. And what you will see is that IHS is just a transliteration of the Greek spelling of the root of Jesus, which is iota, eta, sigma. And that's, and I told you it's a sun, which is why you, if you look up the Jesuit symbol, it's a sun, blazing sun with IHS in it, which is also IES, Jesus. That's the Greek version. And where does that come from? Well, it's a monogram of Bacchus, the sun. And what is Bacchus? It is Bar Kush, son of Kush, who begat Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. This is astro astronomical. Who is the mighty hunter before the Lord in the astrology? Sagittarius. This is why this is where the reckoning of the year occurs at the end of Sagittarius and the beginning of Capricorn. And so in the mystery schools, they, they, spell Bacchus as Yacus, right? Jacus, I-A-C. And so now you have Yacus. Ya being the first two letters of Yova or Jehovah, however you want to say it, Yahweh, Yahuwah, doesn't matter. It's going to be Ya, God. yod Hey, iota Eda in Greek. And so the Christos or Christ means anointed. Messiah is derived from MSH or oil because the Messiah is the anointed, the savior named after water, which saves life and is named after it, which is named after the sun. Therefore, you could take a word like snake oil, and it literally means the anointed savior or sun, because a snake is a serpent or salvator. And serp and salve are shown to be the exact same through philology. I'll do it really quick for you. The A and the E interchange. The L and the R interchange, right? That's why you have lex, law, rex, king. That's why you have legal, regal, loyal, royal. ROY is going to pertain to kings. It's royalty. And so oil is the anointed, just like the Messiah, just like Moses, and just like Jesus. And this is because Jesus is Moses, the divine principle in all truth, the savior of all men, the water of life named after and symbolizing the sun. And this is why um, Messiah in Hebrew Savior and Christ are all the same thing. If you were to spell Messiah in Hebrew, it would just look like it would just look like Mashach, like which would be M S H, but instead it's M S I H. It would be Mem Shin Yud Chet for those who want to look it up on their own. Do you have anything to say, or shall we get uh, into Saint Augustine? No, let's get into it. Um, this right. is pretty, pretty familiar for me from reading your books, but yeah. Okay, no, I just want to make sure that, you know, if you have to chime in about anything, don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. So St. Augustine revealed in uh, Opera Augustini that in our times is the Christian religion, which to know and follow is the most sure and certain health called according to that name, but not according to the thing itself of which it is the name. 
for the thing itself, which is now called the Christian religion, really was known to the ancients, nor was wanting at any time from the beginning of the human race until the time when Christ came in the flesh, whence the true religion, which had previously existed, began to be called Christian. And this, in our day, is the Christian religion, not as having been wanting in former times, but as having in later times received this name. He is telling you that Christianity is from the universal system. It's why Catholic means universal. This is an older system, and all these people were members of the mystery schools themselves. So let's go to St. Cyril of Jerusalem. He said, or wrote, to hear the gospel is indeed permitted to all, but the glory of the gospel is set apart for Christ's genuine disciples only. The Lord spake in parables to those who not hear, but privately explain these parables and similitudes to his disciples. The fullness of the glory belongs to those who are already illuminated. Meaning, you know how to read the Gospels and how they tie it to nature and specifically the Zodiac. The blindness is that of the unbelievers. These mysteries the church communicates to him who is going out of the class of catechumens. Nor is it customary to reveal them to the heathen. For we do not tell to any heathen the secret mysteries concerning the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Neither do we openly and plainly speak of them among the catechumens, but only in a covert and secret manner, so that the faithful, the misty, right, who know them may not be injured. Now, the second of uh, the second council of Constantinople condemned Origen and excommunicated anyone who owned or read his writings. This was when the somewhat correct allegorical teachings in Christianity became suppressed. The fathers, who were the priests of Apollo, which is Pateris, were allegorists. Eustatius, Epiphanius, Jerome, Augustine, etc., Origen's Hexapla, was burned. And judging by him being from Alexandria, it supports the burning of the library there as an attempt to destroy real Christianity so that the European world organizing empire could use the stories as pretext to brainwash the masses and dominate others by citing the scriptures as historical. Now, Augustine also wrote, it is not expedient for the people to know many things which are true and some which, although false, may be otherwise beneficial for the people. Can you imagine the mindset of thinking that you need to lie to people for their benefit? It's crazy. And when you, and you, you can tell this is all the church doing it to itself. You see this mindset over and over in all the things enslaving us. They're constantly behaving like psychopaths, doing really terrible deeds, and then spinning it around as though they're the victims. But the reality is the conquerors of Rome never destroyed the temples, the churches, or the libraries, the books. The most sacred items of religion, when relics, uh, from relics to manuscripts, were kept in the churches. And so if the Goths and others didn't destroy them, then there's no reason for you to not be able to reproduce these relics and scriptures. So the question would be, when called upon by the Mohammedans to produce old authentic manuscripts, why couldn't the Christians produce anything older than the sixth century, especially when the churches of Rome were much older? The challenge for any so-called Christian scholar or otherwise would be to produce an authentic manuscript of the gospels in existence prior to the sixth century which no one has been able to do. And without that, you are likely forming your beliefs based upon emotionalism instead of rationalism. And it's important to note that because emotionalism is a feminine way of thinking and gynocentrism is out of control in the West and it's destroying society. And so if you can't produce anything prior to the sixth century, then none of the stuff that you are claiming authority on or you're claiming to have existed is an authority for the so-called history that you say happened in the first century. 
There's zero. And so Guinevere described Christianity as an edifice for which Judaism provided foundations and all the materials of the superstructure were obtained from the Hellenistic world in the Greek and more accurately Eastern, which would be Asiatic, Syrian, Mesopotamian, Iranian, and um, Egyptian influences. That's where they mingled from the time of Alexander. The Western world was prepared for Christian, uh, for Christian permeation by the propaganda done on their own behalf on the long commercial routes or in the camps by various oriental religious redeeming cults, such as that of Isis and the great mother, which would be Sybil, of Phrygia, of Mithra and others. But it took no part itself in the formation of the new religion. It gulped it down whole, as it were, and after assimilation by it, Christianity became more massive and stricter. Now, um, in Israel's, uh, Israel Worsley's inquiry, he wrote, the doctrine was of very great antiquity, confirming what Augustine, you know, one of the fathers of the Christian church, what you know of it today, already confirmed, right? That it was a very great antiquity and generally received by all the Gothic and Celtic nations. And you don't need to go that far back to see Gothic Jesus, which is literally Jesus. And it was their Mars, if you will, or their Mercury. They're all the same archetype, same as Thoth, whatever. And he's going to go into this. These philosophers taught the supreme God, which would be Tut or Woden. Tut comes from Tooth, Thoth. There's like tons of ways to spell it. So don't get hung up on the spellings. Um, people, some people spell it Thoith. It's, it, there's a, tons of ways to spell it and pronounce it through various cultures. Thus proving Woden is Thoth, Hermes, Mercury, Jesus, etc. And that, that supreme God was the active principle, the soul of the world, which uniting itself to matter had thereby put into a condition to produce intelligences or inferior gods and men. This the poets express by saying that Odin espoused Freya, which if you look at Frey, that's the root of the sun going back to Egypt. It would be Phi, Ro, Eta. Frey, or if you put an accent over it, be free. Free, Masons, Masons of the sun. Or the lady by way of eminence. You were going to say something? No, I, I love it. I mean, one thing that just stuck in my head since you said it too was this, uh, the, the victim mentality and... Uh, the, the feminine quality of just letting this stuff could get out of control. And then uh, just reminded me again of, of the- It's uh, emotionalism. The... It's emotionalism, that's it. And I'm not saying it's female, it's a feminine quality to lead right. with or default to emotionalism. It's nothing against feminine. It's just, that's what it is. Yeah, I think that that's the big distinction with, I, I'm sure people that are listening to this know that, that distinction there too. It's just like saying masculine is a positive force and feminism is a negative force. Doesn't mean good and bad. Rationale, rationale and logic is going to be a masculine way of thinking. That doesn't mean females can't be rational and logic, logical. It's just, that's not their defaulting. You know, they default to emotionalism first. And that's what a lot of people have done in the West because we now think with our emotions. We, we don't, we don't, we don't actually sit down and hear each other out and appreciate and have a meeting of the mind saying, well, what's the truth? We say, this is my belief. And if you don't espouse it, you need to be canceled. Right. And, and we see this and, and they, the people that put this into place, like you, like you're kind of exposing here and through your books and all that kind of stuff, they know this and they know it works really well. Kind of what we're talking about marketing before we start, got on here was they know it works and it's just the way that they do it. And it's like, okay, like, let's get up to speed here and let's just, you know, use these systems kind of against some sort of thing, but it's the same thing. It's rules for radicals, right? That's exactly what it is, is put, put enough, you know, call, call it out to them, put it on them, put out, you know, start all these fires so that they have to get, um, put those out. And then we just go out and do whatever we want. Let's, you know, as the, as the church, you're kind of saying here in like this, this priest class is like, let's destroy all this stuff, hide everything for these savages. And then when they get mad at us, we'll just play victim, right? Oh, and by the way, and if you get mad at us, you also can't get the God. So, you know, maybe, you, maybe you can't it. be, you can't be divided and conquered if you're not defaulting to emotionalism. If you're just in a rational, pragmatic mind, who can conquer you? 
Because then if you're rational, you're not going to make enemies. You're not going to, you know, it's like you can appreciate someone has a different perspective and say, okay, we totally disagree on this, but that's okay. We're entitled to have our own agreements. We can still be friends. We can still do business together. Let's just not talk about that subject or whatever it is, you know, but most people get stirred up emotionally and fear is one of those drivers too that they use. And yeah, that's, that's how you get conquered. And that's what's happening to us right now. Shall I continue? Uh, yeah, just really quick before you do that. That's why I think it's important. Yeah, go ahead. It's why I think it's important to go into this is because like, this is nothing new. They're doing it right now, today, over the past two years, it's been ramped up exponentially, but. Rob, I think that's one of the most defeating things in my work that I come across is when I look back and realize, oh my God, this shit has been going on for as far back as we can see. And the, our frustration with how people are behaving now has been going back as far as we can see. And history you know, like that Mark Twain quote, while it doesn't repeat, it certainly rhymes. It's because our nature doesn't really change. We have a certain biological framework that we're bound by. And it's very difficult to break those patterns because it's wired into us. And so what could a rational person do? A rational person is realistic and says, okay, this is how people are. And this is how I need to leave, lead or live my life so that I'm not, I minimize my exposure to the harm that they're capable of with that way of behavior. And that's what a smart person does is they just insulate themselves from it to the best of their ability. Yeah. And I would also say that maybe the, the Eleusinian kind of idea there and, you know, the classic liberal arts and all that kind of stuff was trying to get to us to a point or to teach this rationality to, to make, to make people understand that there is a way that this world works. There are systems, there are kind of ways of doing things. And again, the easiest way to do that is to just dismantle that, get it out of the education system and teach emotionality like you're talking about before too. Like we were on this track. Yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's a way to think yes. where you don't get caught up in this shit. And that's, you know, when you look into things like the trivium and the quadrivium, there is a way that you people can learn how to think so that they don't get caught up in it. And, you know, it's just basically grammar, logic, rhetoric, input, you uh, process it and then you output it. So continuing back to what Israel Worsley is saying, he said um, they allowed a great difference between the two principles. Uh, all of this, uh, the Supreme was basically eternal, whereas matter was his work and of course had a beginning. And all this was expressed by the phrase, earth is the daughter and wife of the universal father. And from this mystical union was born the god Thor, or Asa Thor, the Lord Thor. And just real quick, the pantheon of gods of the Norse comes from Italians, Etruscans, right? Or Aturians, which are also Phoenicians and Venetians. And their pantheon is called the Aesir. And that would be like Thor, Freya, uh, Odin, Balder, Hoder, all this. But Aesir is the word for God in a much older culture that it comes from. Because they, that's what they are. They're ancient Italians. That's why they use Italian symbol, Aesir, Aesir. And that would be spelled in English, transliterated as A E or the ligature, the A-E ligature, and S-A-R. And so when you aspirate that with a C, you get Caesar. That's where this comes from. And so he was born of the supreme, the greatest of the intelligences that were born of the union of the two principles. The characters given him correspond much with those which the Romans gave to their Jupiter. He too was the thunderer, and to him was devoted the fifth day. Thorgsdag, in German and Dutch, Thunderdag, or Thunder Day. The common oaths of these people mark the same origin. They swear by thunder and blexen, thunder and lightning. Friday took its name from Freya, Freya's Dag, as Wednesday did from Woden, Woden's Dag. Tuis, which is also Tuisco, was the same 
which the old Saxons gave the son of the Supreme when it's Tuesday or two. And sometimes that's spelled T-I-W. Thor, being the firstborn, was called the eldest of the sons. He has made a middle divinity, a mediator between God and man. Such, too, was the Persian's God, for Thor was venerated also as the intelligence that animated the sun and fire. The Persians declared that the most illustrious of all the intelligences was that which they worshipped under the symbol of fire, and they called him Mithra, or the mediator god. And the Scythians called him Goetosiris, the good star. And note the similarity to Osiris. And all the Celtic nations were accustomed to worship the sun, either as distinguished from Thor or as his symbol. It was their custom to celebrate a feast at the winter solstice, when that great luminary began to return again to his part of the heavens, Babylon, India, Troy, Rome, whatever. There's a million names for it. They called it the Yule from Hule, Helios, the sun, which is which to this day signifies the sun in the language of Bretagne and Cornwall, whence the French word Noel. And what I'm going to show in my fifth book that's coming is all of this influence is brought by the Phoenicians because they colonized Britain, especially the Southwest, Wales, England, and you know eventually up to Ireland and all that stuff. So the Bible, the word Bible, it literally means the book, as seen in words like biblos, that would be B-Y-B-L-O-S, city of the book, and things like biblioteca, in, uh, which is a library in Spanish. And it's found in such, uh, as such in the writings of Chaucer. Now, he lived in the 14th century, providing how young, or proving, I should say, how young the Bible is. Scripture means writing. The fact that the good book is called the Bible or that any of its parts are called the book of should set off your intuition. You should be able to acknowledge that no scripture in the Bible had anything to do with the characters of its contents. As seen, they could not produce any document older than the fifth century. It is a story and it's one that's crafted in fairly modern times using systems from older times as admitted by your early Christian fathers, Augustine. Now books weren't invented till the 14th century and the fact that an Englishman can use the word Bible in the 14th century to mean anything other than what it does today proves that the good book didn't exist till later. Now the Nicene Council had to address the inferiority of the son to the father regarding the word, assuming a personality and becoming the generation of the son, S-O-N. And so Christ was changed from being the only son of, uh, to the God of God. But then there was the issue of a time when he was begotten and a time when he was not. And so the Holy, Cons uh, the Holy Spirit was considered subordinate and the clauses respecting its procession and being worshiped together with the father and the son weren't added till 381 AD at the Council of Constantinople. Now, the Christians called Christus, Christus, that'd be C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, -E but it's important to know that the subtle difference is this, it's an Ada. So, be chi, so the root is good, or Chi, Rho, Ada, Sigma. I told you at the beginning that Ada in Greek, it looks like an H, but it's interchangeable with an um, E as well. But if you put an accent over it, it is pronounced like kri, like, like an I, like E. So Kresus would become Christus. And it meant the benevolent or benign. Benevolent is good, hence the origin of the good fellows. Every priest in the Greek church is a pope. So were the priests good men? Or were they good fellas? Because that's what the mafiosi use. Christos is a Hellenistic term for the central element of all true religion. It's the divine principle of in all men. Christianity is the religion of Christos. 
It was Hermeticism in Egypt, Orphism in Greece, Zoroastrianism in per Persia, and uh, Brahmanism in India, Taoism in China, and Shintoism in Japan and China. Canon Farrar revealed that the Manichaeans freely used the name of Christ, but it was with them the mere adoption of a symbolic phrase. Their Christ was not the Christ of the Gospels. He was to them the spirit of the sun. The light spirit from the pure light element of God, not very man, but only clothed with a corporeal semblance. Now, this is important because Manichaeism is based on the conflict between light and darkness. So you see that the checkered floor in Freemasonry, any type of temple to them, that's what that is. And it's hard to ignore Mani, the apostle of light and supreme illuminator's symbolism. Manichaeans created Christ. Freemasonry uses the symbolism, thus Freemasonry is Christian in its symbolism. However, Masonry is much older. The only things left behind in ancient civilizations are temples and palace-related edifices, including walls of the city and ramparts. Now, Masons were paramount to the priest classes and to royalty. Regular houses were not built with stone, but temples were, and they were built to encode the cycles of heaven. And as a result, all Masons are priests, but not all priests are Masons. And as I said earlier, a Freemason is a free, the son, Mason, Freya, a Mason of uh, the free father, Bacchus, Liber Pater, or son of Cush, or Yakus, God Cush. And that's why Nimrod is important to them. And they are quote unquote black gods because this goes back to Krishna, which means black. Masonry has always been present in the mysteries because temples are built to encode their secret symbolism. Otherwise, who would be building the temples? This is confirmed in Robeson's history of a conspiracy against government. And that was written in 1798. And he wrote, the Dionysiacs of Asia Minor were undoubtedly an association of architects and engineers who had the exclusive privilege of building temples. Stadia and theaters under the mysterious tutelage of Bacchus and distinguished from the uninitiated or profane inhabitants by the science which they possessed and by many private signs and tokens by which they recognized each other. This association came into Ionia from Syria into which country it had come from Persia along with that style of architecture which we call Grecian. And these Ionians, what are they? They're sailors, holy sailors. And if you look at what the Greeks are called in the Bible in Hebrew, Yavan. And that looks like Yod, um, Ve'et, uh, and I think um, Nun Sophie. I could, I could be getting that wrong. But um, Yavan or Javan, there's an island called Javan, Java. And that's in Indonesia and the Javans. And I suspect they have something to do with this. And I suspect that they also helped people, the Americas. And I'm going to go into that in my latest book. If not the latest one, I'm going to have to do a follow-up because the one I'm working on right now is getting quite lengthy. And I don't want to publish a book that's too long. Paulicians, then the Catharists, then the... Um, Albigensians tried to revive Manichaeism, but Pope Innocent III thwarted them, announcing that it is necessary that the horrors of war should bring them back to the church. And that's his quote. Can you imagine? The horrors of war should bring them back to the church. And this is also important to note because the Templars were Manichaeans. We can get into that. After the Albigensians were murdered, the Waldensians the Paterini of Milan, the Beguines, uh, the Begards, and others formed revolt, formed to revolt against the Orthodox dogma, which led to the Protestant Reformation. Now, this led to a resurgence of the occult. And so the Manichaeans who were converted to the Orthodox 
were forced to condemn their former tradition. And this is the oath, and this is why this is so significant, significant because I just said like how it was the spirit of the sun to them. They created that word. It's their word. It's their symbolism. And yet everybody else has taken it and perverted it. But let, if you wanted to get back into the fold, this is the, this is the oath you had to take. And I quote, I curse Zarades, which is Zoroaster, who Mane said had appeared as a god before his time among the Indians and Persians and whom he calls the sun. I curse those who say Christ is the sun and who make prayers to the sun and to the moon and to the stars and pay attention to them as if they were really gods and who give them titles of the most lucid gods and who do not pray to the true God only towards the east, but who turn themselves round following the motions of the sun with their innumerable supplications. I curse those persons who say that Zarades and Buddhas, Buddha and Christ and Manichaeus and the sun are all one and the same. Can you imagine? So he's saying, he, sorry, he's saying there that he's saying there essentially that you shouldn't be paying attention to these things, or that he he's, he's yeah been, he's cursing he's cursing everybody who knows the truth right. about who these figures are. Yes. So by saying that Buddha is the sun, despite it there being a Buddhic trinity, besides saying that Zoroaster is the sun, despite it being uh, the sun, Christ, Manichaeus, all of them are one and the same in reality. But in order to get back into the fold, to the Orthodox, you if you were a Manichaean, you had to take that oath and condemn the truth. Right. And and you've you've done this in your work too, where, where the heathens were nothing more than these people who did the exact same thing. And then it was the demonization of these heathens, these uh, you know, hill folk that were too stupid to realize that, oh no, Christ in the flesh and all that sort of stuff. Nothing's changed, Rob. It's the same. It's like everybody who disagrees with me is a, you know, a guy named Adolfo. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, you know, for, for Uncle Algo, you know, we just don't want to, you know, that we do. It's basically if you're not with us, you're against us and you're an enemy and needs to be destroyed. And that's the way a lot of these people work. It's again, it's feminine. It's emotional because you can't compete. You yeah, got to be emotional because you don't want, you don't, they rigged the system because they can't compete. Otherwise, because if they were real men, a real man who's a warrior has zero enjoyment of beating an opponent who's lesser than him. The best thing about being a man is when you best somebody who's actually better than you. And it's like you leveled up in life, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. And it's, it's exactly what we've been seeing over the past two years too, right? Uh, you don't join the club mm -hmm. unless you say these rules, you pledge this oath, you do not say X, Y, and Z, et cetera. It's the same thing. Yep. And that's it. It's just they're giving you access to their system. It's not like these people have real fans, right? Like Owen, he gets banned from something, but he has people that follow him because they want to hear him speak. He has fans. These people, if they were to get banned, nobody would give a shit about them because they're just fucking airy fairy digital ether puppets and if you take one out they'll just put somebody up and prop that up and to continue the show but and, as, and it works as long as they control the system the moment that system collapses or breaks it's going to be totally different um and the reason i harp on augustine a lot of people don't appreciate this it's because he's credited with being the founder of christian theology <laughs> Just as Eusebius is credited with being the founder of the ecclesiastical, the ecclesiastical system. Now, Eusebius, in his ecclesiastical history, wrote, these ancient therapeuti were Christians, and their writings are our gospels and epistles. Epistles are letters, for those who don't know. And this is important because the therapeuti were, quote-unquote, Jews and Buddhists, and it's one of the many proofs of Christianity's origin. Going back to that oath I just read you, having to curse people who claim Buddha is the son, right? So in regards to Augustine, Farrar wrote that his personality becomes less attractive as his episcopy becomes more triumphant, until at last the man who sighed so ardently for Christian charity 
and was so much opposed to sacerdotal tyranny, uses expressions and arguments which become the boasted watchwords of the most ruthless inquisitors and are quoted to sanction deeds so unchristian and so infamous as the brutalities of Alva and the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Now Eusebius quoted an apology to the Roman emperor Marcus Antonius by Bishop Melito in 171 AD. And it reads, the philosophy which we profess truly flourished, flourished aforetime among the barbarous nations. But having blossomed again in the great reign of thy ancestor Augustus, it proved to be above all things ominous of good fortune to thy kingdom. Now, if you look at my work, I think Augustus is not a historical person, but that's for another time. According to Vittorio Di Macchioro, uh, the history of Christianity has been a long process of disintegration. From the apostolic age down, it has shown a dispersive tendency, a tendency to divide, dissolve into churches, sects, and heresies. The centrifugal tendency is remarkable in a religion which had its center in a person and ought therefore to present the greatest unity. Alan Upward wrote from his Divine Mystery, on the surface, the Israelite legend is an attempt to find in the national history an illustration of Zoroastrian theology. Now it's claimed that the Neoplatonic philosopher Plotinus brought the doctrine of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost to Augustine. It was based on his three fundamental hypotheses, the soul, the intellect, and the one. The irony being that Plotinus was a heathen. So Sinaeus, Bishop of Alexandria, this is fourth century, he wrote, in my capacity as Bishop of the church, I shall continue to disseminate the fables of our religion, but in my private capacity, I shall remain a philosopher till the end. You learned previously of all the Arabic words we used in English. If you go look in the books, if you look at my, um, I've gone over this, I'm not going to get into it. Halim explained why in the Middle Ages, why we have that Arabic influence. It must not be supposed that these absurdities were produced as well as nourished by ignorance. In most cases, they were the work of deliberate imposture. Every cathedral or monastery had its tutelar saint, and every saint, his legend, fabricated in order to enrich the churches under his protection by exaggerating his virtues, his miracles, and consequently his power of serving those who paid liberally for his patronage. Not till the Mohammedan science and classical free thought and industrial independence broke the scepter of the church did the intellectual revival of Europe begin. Massey wrote in Natural Genesis, but it is well known as a matter of history that the worship of Isis and Horus descended in the Christian centuries to Alexandria, where it took the form of the worship of the Virgin Mary and the infant savior, and so passed into the European ceremonial. We have, therefore, the Virgin Mary connected by linear succession and descent with that remote zodiacal cluster in the sky. Um, G.R.S. Mead wrote, the new method was to force out into the open for all men a portion of the sacred mysteries and secret teachings of the few. The adherents of the new religion itself professed to throw open everything, and many believed that it revealed all that was revealable. This was because they were as yet children. So bright was the light to them that they believed it came directly from the God of all gods, or rather from God above, for they would have no more gods. The gods were straightway transmuted into devils. The many had begun to play with psychic and spiritual forces let loose from the mysteries, and the many went mad for a time and have not yet regained their sanity. You see that. You see that today. Look at the ether argument. 
You know, if you look up what the meaning of ether is, let me see, I have this like saved right now. You have all these things in our world of science that literally come from the occult and they're designed like a lot of the shit that we think is real is just the priests of Apollo or whichever brand of the cult is releasing this shit. And it fucks with your mind and takes you out of the natural world. So if you were to look up ether, right? Like a physics the term, a uh, physics term, sci scientific term, it's not science, but you would get um, a theoretical universal substance believed during the 19th century to act as the medium for transmission or electromagnetic waves, much as sound waves are transmitted by elastic media, such as air. Media is just plural for medium. Why that, that matters is because it's theoretical, meaning not actual, so not real. It's a substance or a medium, which invokes that it's physical, yet, if you look into it, everybody will claim it's un unmanifested. It's not something that can be measured in the physical world. Therefore, it's not physical. It's, if it's not physical, it can't be invoked with a definition as being physical or a medium or a substance. And so what does that mean for everybody who's going to get triggered when they hear this? It means there's no such thing as ether. And this is a sacred cow. I had to kill myself. And so I had to go back into aug, aug, slightly augmenting my first book because I had mentioned ether, but I did it from a term of the occult. I did it as primordial ether, universal ether. I spoke of it in those terms, loosely defined and not scientific or more importantly, not physics related as how it, what it is in the real world. And so the reason I'm harping on this is we have been really messed up mentally by occultists. And in order to get out of that, we have to start really learning how to use the trivium and think logically about these things and put to bed all the nonsense so we can kind of clean everything off and purify everything. So what's left is actual real world things that we can learn from. And so if you accept any of these figures as historical, which I'm not suggesting you should, but if you do, Paul was a member of the cult of Dionysus, which entails the Bacchic and the Eleusinian mysteries, right? Helios. Augustine was a Manichaean. Tertullian was a Montanist, right? A tradition where Montanus was the Messiah rather than Jesus. Justin Martyr showed the Old Testament was quote unquote prophecy from the oracles of the Sibyls. Ammonius Saccus, right? The sacred Amun was, which is the sun for the audience who's not familiar with this. They take names after the sun. They take names after God. That was what they did back then. Sometimes you have to wonder if it's a real person or just an archetype, but he was affiliated with Neoplatonism and Plotinus gave Augustine the Trinity secrets, which come from the Hellenic world and trace back to Hindustan. Now in a letter to Servianus, the emperor, um, emperor Hadrian wrote, those who worship set a piece are likewise Christians. Now, if anybody who wants to look this up, you will see set a piece in Egypt. It looks just like Jesus. Spell it out. It's S-E-R-A-P-I-S. -E Do the work and you'll see it. Even those who style themselves the bishops of Christ are devoted to set a piece. Guinebert figured out uh, it's, it is a most singular and astonishing fact sought to be developed in this work that the Christian faith as embodied in the Apostles' Creed finds its parallel or dimly foreshadowed counterpart article by article in the different systems of paganism here brought under review. No one can be more astonished at this than the author himself. It reveals a unity of religion and shows that the faith of mankind has been essentially one and the same in all ages. It furthermore points to but one source and author. And this is going to go into the universal system that I'm, I'm going to expose in my latest book and how this happened. J.R.L. Morrill wrote in Spiritism and the Beginnings of Christianity, Christianity 
is but a combination of Pythagorean spiritualism with the essential features of pagan supernaturalism in which every trace of the original spiritualism has been distorted or suppressed. And the symbols greatly exaggerated and interpreted literally as Christianity. Uh, Guignabert also exposed Augustine um, in another segment of his work, all the medieval evaluation of Christian theology in the West originated with St. Augustine, a Manichaean. He is the founder of the mysticism of the Reformation as well as the Middle Ages, and he is an inspiration to Protestantism um, as he was to the medieval church. His dread statements also on the necessity of punishing the sacrilegious furnished the justification in advance of all the later medieval intolerance and the Inquisition. No one contributed more than he toward the adoption of the opinion that a decision of the church is a truth against which human reason is not qualified to rebel, and that the worth of Holy Scripture itself is due to the guarantee and the interpretation given it by the church, which had nothing to do with Jesus, mind you, if you accept Jesus as a historical figure. The church exterminated Priscillianists at the end of the fourth century for having different views on the canon and for practicing the same austerities, which are spiritual practices, as St. Martin. Of this, Farrar wrote, and for the first time, the acts of the executioner was reddened with the blood of Christians, shed by Christians to avenge a difference of opinion. That bloodshed, like the beginning of sin, was indeed a letting out of water, and the crimson stream was destined in after ages to roll for many a furlong bridal deep. Guinea Bear uncovered a vast conspiracy. He wrote, it is a fact that they did derive advantage thus and so persistently that the Greeks have some little foundation for saying, as they do, that the fabrication of documents is the characteristic industry of Rome. And at these inventions, Gregory VII, as well as Nicholas I, with himself be caught, and all other popes throughout the Middle Ages. Nearly every pontificate will add its supplement of, of false documents to this formidable corpus, whence theologians, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, among them, will for a long period confidently derive the juris justification for whatever the Roman pontiffs may desire to do or to say. Much more guilty than the forgers themselves are men such as Baronius, Bellar uh, Bellarmine, and different Jesuits who in the 16th century and 17th centuries employed their erudition and their zeal in the face of considerations of fact and good sense, which admit of no reasonable rejoinder to bolster up a body of arguments for the sake of conclusions drawn from them, which they could not consent to abandon. About the time of Gregory VII in particular, this would be uh, 1073 to 1085 AD, the work of forging false documents and their system, uh, systematic utilization, i.e. the fitting them together into a body of doctrine, reached a magnitude and a degree of openness absolutely stupefying. Towards the year 1440, the monk Gratianus, the first professor of canon law in the University of Bologna, blends together the early forgeries, adds others, and constitutes a corpus, which becomes a legal framework of the papal system and of an authority beyond dispute. Do you see why this matters to all this shit you've done with the legal world and stuff and all the guests you've had and how this is all tying back to the, the ecclesiastical system? Think about this. And this is what a lot of these people don't wanna talk because you they always talk about this like sovereign stuff and all this other shit but they'll never turn the light back onto the church once it comes because they're all doing it by, well, the Bible says this, and this is why we're, you know, and they're using this for this legal framework that you see making the rounds on all these podcasts, the Patriot mythology, whatever you want to call it. They're all using the Bible as like their flag to fly. And it's written by the priests of these evil systems uh, without exception. And that's how serious the situation is. 
Shall I continue? Or do you got anything to say? No, well, just on that in particular, I, I remember having that thought too. Reading your work, I was actually thinking that like, they all say, you know, the Bible is the reason why all these things are kind of solidified and they still have to bring it into the courtroom and oh, they're, they're all bound by this biblical law. And then reading your work on that kind of stuff is like, well, if it's their book, then of course they're going to try and do that. And of course they're going to try and like make you think that that's your way out as well. Yep. And they wear black, not because black is evil. Black is Apollo, the black God. Black is the winter sun. Black is Nimrod. Black is Kush. Black is Chris. No. Black is Christ. Black virgin. The black bambino. They're not nodding to a, a culture of sub-Saharan people. These are symbolic. These are color symbolism. They're representing who they are. And so Edward Carpenter wrote regarding Heracles or Hercules, right? The pride of the lady, Hera. And Krishna, in Pagan and Christian Creeds, that was the book, what we chiefly notice so far are two points. On the one hand, the general similarity of these stories with that of Jesus Christ. On the other, their analogy with the yearly phenomena of nature, as illustrated by the course of the sun in heaven and the changes of vegetation on the earth. Massey wrote in his uh, the history, the historical Jesus and the mythical Christ, and I quote, a profound study of the ritual reveals the fact that the wisdom of Egypt was the source and foundation head of the books of wisdom assigned to Moses and David, to Solomon and Jesus, and also proves the personages and characters to have been Egyptian. It is chiefly the wisdom of Egypt that gives a value to the Hebrew writings. And again, he writes, the story of the Annunciation, the miraculous conception or incarnation, the birth and the adoration of the Messiah, uh, Messianic infant had already been engraved in stone and represented in four consecutive scenes upon the innermost walls of the Holy of Holies, the um, Meskin in the Temple of Luxor, which was built by Amenhotep III, about 1700 BC or some 17 centuries before the events depicted are commonly supposed to have taken place. Now, Herodotus, the so-called father of history, that's where that play on uh, words comes from, his story, it's Herodotus' story. He never mentioned Solomon's temple at Jerusalem. So neither Herodotus nor Plato mentioned Solomon's existence nor does Herodotus mention, mention Israelites at all. This is an indicator that it's all allegory, guys, <laughs> right? How could Herodotus travel by Jerusalem on his way to Babylon and Egypt or the regions that we call such because there were no regions that were ever, Egypt was never called Egypt. These are astronomical names assigned to literal places. Egypt was called Chem. That's another story. So how could he pass these places, um, write about them and not mention Solomon and the wonder of his temple's architecture that allegedly cost nearly 8 billion in gold? Herodotus was born in 484 BC when um, the history of the Old Testament was literally playing out, allegedly. Yet he mentions none of this. Why? Because these stories are not historical or literal, and they are not as old as the claims of those who forged them say they are. It's also likely that Plato um, and Herodotus weren't even historical, and that I'm writing about, literally, in this, I'm writing about fictional straw men from within the confines of fictional straw men, but I do it to make a point that if you don't have historians talking about something that is as big as that, and they were in those regions, there's no way it was real. Otherwise, there'd be many other accounts of this stuff. It's also likely um, that, uh, so Solomon's empire is fiction, right? It's not likely, it is. If Herodotus, Plato, and Diodorus Siculus were historical individuals, how could they not notice Solomon's empire? Moses and Homer never mentioned the pyramids, Roman historians, never named Stonehenge, Avery, or Karnak. English historians never named Avery. 
the history is written by, and this is going, this is in, uh, Avery is an interesting thing. Not much is left of it. Even by like the 17, 1800s, a lot of it had been like repurposed and put into like, they take the stone and repurpose it into buildings nearby. But the histories written by historians are merely mythoses written by priests. And that's what I'm trying to harp on people is they have patterns. And once you can identify the patterns, once they have more than like three of them, you know that it's mathematically impossible for them to be a historical story when you see allegory and astrotheology encoded in their life's history. So to what extent the people and locations of history existed, I cannot say. Um, history is at the mercy of what remains in edifices, jewelry, tools, and the like. Coins are a big one. That's, those are usually really good if you can find a preserved coin. That's not too worn. Um, these are usually found in masonry of the era of artifacts preserved in the earth. Um, a lot of people will talk about like mud floods and stuff. I think it's just the way the soil works uh, with like animals. Like when you when things get dung, the 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 ground increases. Like when you have you have like in Scott um, in England you see or uh, Britain you see this all the time. There's all these old places that have been covered up because sheep and stuff. They're in sheep pastures or whatever, and over time the soil, whether it's from goats, you name it, builds up and just you know, their dung turns into soil and it covers everything. But some of it has been intentionally buried. There's no question that there's definitely stuff that has been built on top of stuff. Um, but history, uh, where was I here? So this, so going back to your original question, when you're asking like, why language? Well, the exception of all this, when you run out of real world language, uh, evidence is language and the traditions of a culture. Um, so when two cultures with no known historical interaction use the same language, um, mathematics, religious rites, and then uh, a history that doesn't account for this is something to be suspicious of, i.e. what they found in Mexico. Um, Perosis, Strabo, Diodorus, and Herodotus made no mention of the Israelites crossing, crossing the parted waters of the Red Sea. Imagine being a history, a historian around the times these events would be talked about and hearing no accounts of it by Egyptians, Jews, Arabs, or Syrians. I mean, that's, that's nonsense. It's also nonsense that a guy could preach for one year and become famous in the ancient world where people don't travel that much and the ability to share information over a broad scale doesn't exist yet. The Gospels are not quoted in early Christian writings until near the beginning of the third century. No one in the first two centuries left anything behind, such as a record or a letter of correspondence regarding Jesus's existence. Not one person inspired by Jesus's physical presence and voice left the record of him. He emerges only in the fateful century where the church takes over and leads humanity into eonial darkness. But many characters already existed in the image of Jesus that was uh, that Jesus was fashioned by, uh, such as Bacchus, which Jesus's name is a monogram of, Dionysus, which is Bacchus, Tammuz, Isdubar, Mithra, Vitoba, Krishna, Horus, and many more. Were he a historical man, the records of his existence would have come from the era in which he lived but they don't. They come from centuries after he alleged to live. So even if you want to accept the fact that he was historical, nothing you know about him comes from the time his history existed in. They come from a priest class of an evil institution that has enslaved the world and deprived everybody in it of property, including the lords and the kings. So a gentleman named Budge observed in his book of the dead at all events, the one God of the Egyptians possessed all the essential attributes of the Christian God. Now let's talk about Philo. He was a contemporary of what would have been the historical Jesus, yet he didn't write one word about him, just like with Paul. Massey also discovered the sobering reality about this, and he wrote, the true Christ, whether mythical or mystical, astronomical or spiritual, never 
could become a historical personage and never did originate in any human history. Josephus never mentioned the word Christ anywhere except in a testimony that was never quoted by any Christian prior to Eusebius, the father of ecclesiastical history. And even Bishop Warburton called it a rank and stupid forgery. Eusebius was a liar and forger for the church. And Origen also claimed Josephus did not acknowledge Christ, and he died almost a century before Eusebius. So Philo never mentions Christ in the flesh or Christ being crucified. Um, and there's nothing to suggest he knew of these creations of the church, yet some try to claim he borrowed from the New Testament when it was the other way around. And there are 35 examples listed in this book, A God's Acre for Winds of the Soul, of the terms and doctrines found in Philo with parallel passages from the New Testament. Dive in and see it for yourself. Don't take my word for any of this. Now, let's broach another subject that is a hot topic related to this. Being Semitic is predicated on being a descendant of Shem, not just speaking a Semitic language. However, there is no such thing as a Semitic language because there was no such thing as Shem. Even the most learned of the Christian church will admit the farce conceptualized in the word Semitic, regardless if they admit that Shem is a personification. Archbishop Richard Trench wrote, it was Eichhorn who first suggested the calling of a certain group of languages, which stand in a marked contradistinction to the Indo-European or Assyrian family by the common name of Semitic. A word which should include all these was wanting, and this one was handy and has made its fortune. At the same time, implying, as Semitic does, that these are all languages spoken by races which are descended from Shem. It is eminently calculated to mislead. From an archbishop, why don't you people listen to me or listening to this, go look up how many archbishops exist in the world and you tell me if that's a powerful position or not. He continues, there are non-Semitic races, the Phoenicians, for example, which have spoken a Semitic language. There are Semitic races which have not spoken one. That's interesting. So if all these languages like Hebrew are Semitic and they observe in Greek observably come from the Phoenician who are admittedly not Semitic, how are they Semitic? It's, you have to be brain dead and unlearned not to buy into this shit. And the reason my work is so powerful is because it exposes everything. All the lies get burned and purified away and what you will have left is exactly what you see at the end of the Wizard of Oz. It's the, some old crabby dude behind a curtain who has zero power at all but what you give him. So many people, they painted the picture of Eusebius as one who was eager to lie about subjects where there was no historical evidence, right? Eusebius's ecclesiastical history is the primary work supporting the history, the historical narrative of Christianity, right? He met with Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. He tells a story, or this tells a story, I should say, right? He's in bed with the evil. Wait wrote of Eusebius, no one has contributed more to Christian history and no one is guilty of more mistakes. The sentiments of this historian are made not only carelessly and blunderingly, but in many incidences or instances in falsification of the facts of history. Not only the most unblushing falsehoods, but literary forgeries of the vilest character darken the pages of his apologetic and historical writing. And the Greeks called Christians uh, self-murderers. So it'll be a uh, biothanati. And that is because many monks ended their careers in suicide by ripping themselves open and jumping off cliffs into wells. They also drowned and hanged themselves, having paid no taxes or rendering any services. The monks terrorized the civil government, and Farrar had this to say about them grossly ignorant, hopelessly superstitious, brutally fanatical. The monks of Egypt became, as a body, the vilest instruments of the worst character in ecclesiastical history. And again, 
Mariolatry, which is saint worship. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not saint, saint worship. Let me, let me start over. He says, Mariolatry, saint worship, relic worship, terrors of demons, dream divinations, lying legends. Legende, that means lie in German, actually. The, the same word, lying and legend are the same word. Invented miracles in every form of crude superstition, acquired strength from their support. The, the ever-increasing multitude of vagrants and bigots whose squalid virtues were repaid by a sort of adoration denuded the empire of its natural defenders and left it a prey to the barbarians. Valens was more than half right in rescinding the immunity from military service, which constituted for so many the temptation to monasticism. Um, and in sweeping thousands of these sturdy idlers from Egyptian deserts into the ranks of his army. He called them without any circumlocution, the followers of laziness. Uh, Sinusius speaks of them, he's a bishop, as barbarous, indolent, brutal. Salvian shows how much the monks were hated and the fury with which pagans like Libanius, uh, Unapius, Zosimus, and Rutilius speak of them is explained, if it be not excused by the scathing pictures drawn by all the greatest of the fathers of the Ramiboth, uh, the Massalians, the Yeravaji, and other classes of criminals and hypocrites who lived under the shelter of the monk's cow. Hermits, monks, and even nuns lived in a state of revolting dirt, which they regarded as one proof of their piety. They left a most unfavorable opinion on the cultivated heathen. Eunapius speaks of their swinish life, swine being a pig, their tyrannous, uh, tyrannous self-assertion, their neglect of public decency, their filth, and nakedness. And why is this so significant, significant everybody, especially all these people in these spaces researching these things? because monks control the system now and who are monks? Jesuits. And something else controls them through the dark occult. And when you look at all these things going back to feudalism, they're holding the, the land, Frank Almoin and Lemoin is the monks. So they're able to hold land on behalf of the church, tax-free, live like sovereigns. And then when they die, it goes back into the fold of the church. So the only people, if you get the land from the church, because the church has claimed ownership of everything, you have to pay a product, a percentage of it, of your, your, your tithe, your 10% of productivity of the land. And if you don't, they'll start a war and kill you. And now we have this just in different forms, more hidden forms, property taxes, yada, yada, yada. So I yield back, take us, to, take us away any direction you want. Floor is yours, Rob. And thank you for sitting through that. No, I, I appreciate it, man. I think it's it's so in-depth that it takes multiple listens. Uh, I'm sure as some people are listening will will attest to that. Have replay value. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's why I love doing these things too, right? A digital asset is great because it can expand to, multiple, to so many people, but also you can review it in so many ways. Um, your work is just as detailed as what you do obviously that's your work there so it's it, it's it's it, it it's what i was saying in the beginning where it like it demands something of the viewer as well um one thing I, i've been dying to ask you just in terms of reading your work and all that kind of stuff because i think i i think i potentially know the answer to this but when you when you do this and when you're doing your work and when you're exposing these lies and stuff i feel like some something of the other side or or maybe the opposing view of this is thinking that you're some sort of atheistic person that's just, you know, this some, something similar to like a Sam Harris kind of guy where it's like, oh, all you're doing is shitting on them. What's the point of you kind of going about this? Like spirituality has great things uh, involved in it. And all you're doing is, you know, trying to dismantle these lies. So what, what, what is it that you're actually doing here? And like, why is this important? I serve truth and God, and there is no one and nothing I'm unwilling to sacrifice in my service to that. So anybody who's going to go against me, just know that that's the kind of energy you're dealing with. It's not about me. It's not about what I think about anything. It's not about belief. It's not about a group of people. I don't play favorites. It's about serving the truth because the truth is objective. It is singular and it is knowable and discoverable by all 
And the only way we can make a good decision about any matter is to be able to peel away all the lies, all the forgeries, clean it off. It's like taking an artifact out of the dirt, archaeology, clean it off and say, what are we looking at? And we may all have different opinions about what we're looking at, but what is not up for debate is that we are looking at an artifact. What is it? And so if we want to ever get to the bottom of a matter, we have to be able to do that in our society. And we can't right now because we are in, we claim to have free speech, but it is not free. And if you don't say what they want you to say, or you say what they don't want you to say, they have all these algorithms in place to basically silence you digitally in an age where everything is corralled into digital platforms. And most people's lives and businesses are are engaged at least partially through the internet. And if we want to undo this system of control and ever going back to being able to own our property outright, outright and not have to pay taxes on it, we have to undo the system. It's not right that somebody works their whole fucking life, they own their land, everything, but they still have to pay property taxes. Now they're an old person who can't work anymore and they can't fucking keep the house that they paid off because they can't afford the tax, which is assigned or evaluated at some arbitrary value based on what they think in the current market. This is the most demonic fucking, damn it, trying to get through this podcast without swearing. This is demonic. People ask me what's going on. Demon infestation, deal with it. I'm not fucking exaggerating. I'm telling you the truth. Demonic. In every sense of the word, D to negate, right? Like deconstruct and mon from manos, one. They are cut off from the one, God. And as I told you when I covered the hypostases, which the Trinity comes from, the one is one of them. Because one, the one, solus, is another name for God. Sol Invictus, invincible God, the sun. Right, yeah. So, yeah, so that's what's behind it for me. And it's because I, I don't play fate. I want to see a better life for everybody. We don't have to like each other. We don't, we could be enemies, but I wouldn't want this shit happening to my worst enemies. You should still be able to live freedom. Basically the tenets of our country, pursuit of happiness. You know what I mean? Like everybody ought to have the freedom within reason, as long as you're not causing harm to other people, stealing, that's what that means. As long as you're not stealing from somebody, you should be able to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anyone else and within the framework of the community all those communities will decide what they want to tolerate and what is acceptable for them right that's where you get like building codes and all that stuff that's all fine but this idea of centralize everything into a one world system that's what they're doing with the internet that's why everything's going to the digital age because that's the only way they can actually control everything is through a digital computerized system they can't do it through the natural world it'll never work because the real world doesn't work that that's not how nature works you know so it's it's for everybody i did this for everybody and i sacrificed the best years of my life i should have been building businesses i should have been making money i should have been having a family and instead i did this because i didn't see anybody doing this as a satisfact in a satisfactory way that can actually tie it into the big picture people are doing like little things in little pockets but nobody is as comprehensive as me and um this is going to sound arrogant but I don't mind. I'm the best in the world at what I do. And it's because I stand on the shoulders of the best in the world at what they did. And I'm like an amalgamation of them. And in 10 years, 20 years, whatever, someone else will be the best in the world at, at this because they are standing on my work. That's how it goes. But right now, there's nobody you're going to find that's better than spirit world without, you know, in one place. And that's the whole point is to, for the audience to be able to get this knowledge, go through this journey, upgrade themselves, without sacrificing the decades, without spending the thousands of dollars, without sacrificing the thousands of hours, which if you're a smart business person, that translates to millions of dollars because you could have been doing something so fruitful instead of learning about this shit on your own, as I had to. Learning languages the exact way you're not supposed to learn them through reading them and not speaking them. That's not a good thing, but it's useful because all these dead languages are no longer spoken. So the only time you're ever going to look at them is through artifacts. They're not spoken anymore. So you have to learn them through reading them. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why I think your work is so important, um, especially for people such as myself, when I found your work, when I was truly looking for these answers. And, you know, I think 
it's, it's, it's frustrating. I'm sure it's frustrating for you, but it's also frustrating just in terms of like, these are things that we shouldn't have to spend all this time on. Like these, like what you're talking about, things like the trivium, things like understanding how to think we should be outrightly doing that. And also what you're talking about before about being nature is by, by nature decentralized. There's no, there's no centralizing like, um, way that it works it's, it's fractal in its own nature which means it's decentralized and all that kind of stuff which means that like by nature we should be too like we should know business we should know how to be entrepreneurial we should know how to do all these kind of things we should know how to think all that kind of stuff and we're, we're kind of kept in these boxes that's why i think your work's important um that's why also like i love the fact that you've went this way with language and i just for, for some people i know it can be very confronting what you're what you're talking about here because you don't you have no sacred cows you you don't pull punches and I find I kill my own sacred cows. That's what, you know, I had to, I had to do this work. Right. And I, I think I come from a Christian, I come from a Christian background. It's not like I'm sitting here as like a Muslim or Jew or some other person that's like trying to go after someone's religion. It's just easier for me to go after my own because then you can't play that silly ass victim card. He's a racist. He's a bigot. He's anti-Christian. No motherfucker. I come from that. And more so than you, because I'm actually the culture. I am Roman. I am Venetian. I am Phoenician. I am Trojan, Trojan, from Troy. I have all these, I am from Caesar. I have these names in my freaking families. So for me to expose them, I'm going at my own kind the hardest, which very few people can do because they don't want to lose their, as uh, Owen says, their fancy pants and their lollipops. Right. Yeah, and it's- it's. I already it's lost my fancy pants and the lollipops because I wasn't down to get down with the, the gay mob in Hollywood, so. Right. Yeah. And then th this is, this is the problem that we are having with even, even earlier in this talk, you know what I mean? Um, paying, paying attention to the algorithm and even having to mince words and all that kind of stuff is the reason like they are terrified of the truth ever coming out because they can't survive in truth, which by definition, these are the beta males. These are the beta males. They can't compete in the physical world. So they, their, their male, their competitive strategy, whether it's mating or otherwise is what systems. They know they can't beat you on the battlefield. You, they're not going to get women over you. So the way they do that is to find a way to box you out. So they create a system that you can't thrive in and they digitally assassinate you. And as long as they can control the system and the currencies, you know, that's why like gold and silver was so significant as physical currency, because you can't create it out of nothing. It's something that is rare. And if you're going to get it, you either have, you have to get it by either conquest or business. And so you think some beta male can say, oh, I really want to be rich. Let me go try to beat down the gates of Rome and take all their gold. Good luck to you. You know, you can't do this shit until there's rot and collapse. And that's why they always constantly engineer and collapse because that's when you can take advantage of people most. And it creates this vacuum or something else can come in. And um, the priest class always had, like, I'm convinced the sack of Rome was invited by the priest class to get rid of Italy's kings and to redo the system again, right? And so I, you see this over and over again because they keep leaving all the things in place that if you were actually destroying your enemy, they would be the first things you destroy to get rid of them for good. But they always leave all that stuff. And it's because war, all this stuff, it doesn't work the way we believed it does. The people fighting it, they're just dupes. Can't think for themselves. They get caught up in emotionalism, not logic. And then they become cannon fodder, you know? Fodder for the fucking chariots, whatever you want to call it. It's brutal. And you lose the, you know, some of the brightest and best people because to be a warrior in the first place, especially if like you're in special forces, any of that stuff, you're not just physically fit. You're fucking mentally incredible to be able to operate under pressure, to be able to come up with solutions and challenges. These are like the brightest people we have in our nation and we're allowing them to be used abroad for pawns of these beta males because the beta males can't fucking compete. And that's what this all comes down to. And so until we, this is what I would set out as I'm trying to get my work to the blue collar people, to the, the masculine people, to awaken them. Because if they don't, you're literally being farmed out of existence. And all you got to do is look at testosterone levels. You go back to 2001, old men had more testosterone 
back in 2001, guys in like their six, late 60s, than guys in their early 20s do today. They are literally destroying masculinity. And that's why I said earlier, gynocentrism is out of control in the West and it's destroying the fabric of civilization. It's destroying family units because they all lead with emotionalism. So if you want stability, you can't invite emotionalism in the decision-making process of your systems of government, the end, or governance or whatever, whatever you framework you want to run your society by. Right. Yeah. And this is why, honestly, I really loved uh, paying attention to your journey from book one to where you are now too, because of the, the changes we kind of went over over the last time you were on with Get Matter, Get Realistic was, um, you know, I, I think a huge portion we were talking about that before we started as well was trying to find a way now to, I guess, just make these people ir- irrelevant. Like they can't compete with us. So they're trying to put us in these boxes. So that's what I, you know, I've shared with you as well is that's what's driving me now with this content and trying to, what I'm going to be doing, you know, in the near future here, we're switching things up and trying to get these messages out in a more, um, you know, a more streamlined way in a more kind of viral way potentially is because like, there's ways that we, I mean, we, we cannot, we cannot do them. We can, we can make them irrelevant in our lives. We just have to find out the kind of way to do that. And the infighting and all that kind of BS that's happening in here is, is just, you know, not helpful, but you know, I think it, it, it for me as a listeners, it, it really just for me is heed what's being said here in terms of like breaking down these things, breaking down your beliefs and building that back, building them back up on truth. Because I think the, the, the transformation that you've went through from book one to now is like testament to that as well. And mm-hmm. I just, I think that- like, I was defaulting to emotionalism in book one in certain, you know what I mean? Like there's certain times like that. It's not that I was defaulting to emotionalism so much. There is that. It's that I was still so steeped into the occult because that's all I was around in Hollywood. Like, and so- there's stuff that I wrote then that I'm kind of cringeworthy now, even though it's not wrong. My I've looked at it and said, oh, I was basically on the path of a priest. And I was basically being, for better or worse, whether it's intentional or not intentional, being duped to behave like an Egyptian priest with lifestyle choices and all that stuff. And it's philosophically sound. So I left it as is and didn't ever like adjust it, but it's idealistic and it's not realistic and if you live your life with idealistic behaviors or um, ways of thinking you're going to be destroyed not only in intersexual dynamics but in business and every other aspect of your life you are not going to be able to perform well in a way that benefits you because you're going to make the wrong decisions based on idealism and that's that's where my work really changes is um I settled down and it's also, you know, looking at the dark stuff in the modern era, it is enraging when you, when you see the disgusting shit that's going on in this world, it is enraging. And it's hard to like boil that out where it's like, you know, we've got to decorate the cities with these motherfuckers. If you get what I'm saying, you know, you know, you got to like just withdraw. And like you were saying, you got to, I mean, the temporary solution isn't really so like it's, it's difficult, but you just have to keep putting out work and find ways to do do things in ways that don't set off algorithms and maybe don't necessarily trigger aren't triggering topics. Like nobody's going to give a shit about this conversation because it's about religion. And so the powers that be don't really care about this because we're not talking about the current agendas. We're talking about ancient stuff. The people who control the algorithms aren't even smart enough to censor this unless they're doing it personally, right? So that's the best way to do it is this isn't something that you can blame on one person. This is something that is a system. I wish it were easy as, you know, pointing fingers, but we all participated some to a lesser degree, some, you know, some, you know, but even the people that you could blame, they're still born into this system. They're still born into these expectations of whatever society their, you know, parents are part of, you know, all that stuff. So, there is no other way to get out of this than for all of us to collectively say, this is all our fault. What can we do now? The thing that we cannot do though, 
is say, oh yeah, this is all our fault and allow the people who are violent, predatory freaks to just get a free ride. Oh yeah, we all admit we took responsibility. Yeah, we all do this. No, 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 you gotta pay. You get, if, you, if you're a murderer, you're a rapist, you're all these disgusting people, you need, uh, you know, you just need to be made to decorate the city. That's the only way I can describe it without setting off the algorithms. You know, I'm gonna decorate the city with you, preferably at night to get my meaning. Yeah, that's what it used to be, right? Upside, like... upside, upside down, Roman style. You know, they're lucky yeah. that I'm not in power. They are lucky that I am not in power because I would literally call it Woden's Forest, and every single one of them would have a nice statue in a plot of land, probably somewhere in the Midwest where it's not affecting anything. And we would make them into statues and put a nice gold plaque that lists their terrible deeds, and it would be a, a required field trip. For everyone to go to and say, this is what this wicked person did that caused the decline of our civilization. And we are not going to tolerate this. Not now, not ever again. And if you get any ideas, this is you're going to end up here. And that gold is eternal. So even if the statue sort of corrodes, you know, with them inside it, obviously. If that statue corrodes, that gold plaque will remind future generations because the problem is, is there are no consequences in this country. People do absolute atrocities. They fuck up other countries who otherwise should be our friend and also should be prosperous and we should be doing business with them. But instead, they're being suppressed and pillaged. And they're, live, they're, they're living in squalor, like not even in the modern era, especially like places like Eastern Europe, because these motherfuckers in, uh, you know, the upper echelons of America and the Western worlds, they're like these rich yuppies who think it's okay to just pillage the world. And so they can live high on the hog at everybody else's expense. And the common people have absolutely nothing in common with these freaks at the top. And we should be doing trade with people in Iran, with people in China, with people in Korea. We should all be able to interact with each other, independent of government, and be friends. We don't have to accept each other's values or religions or beliefs. But we should be able to be friends and do business together and not have motherfuckers in power saying, oh, we don't like your a belief or your opinion or anything else, so we're just going to shut this off and you can't do business. This is disgusting. And the fact that the world is tolerating this shows you how feminine it's gotten. And people who have the right mindset about, you know, you want something to do? Give me power. I'll do something real serious about it. They're not going to do that because there's too many whiny little bitches who wouldn't support me. But no back, no support. So fuck it. You're going to get the world of feminine enslavement. Enjoy it. Enjoy the rot. I don't know what else to tell you. So create something of value outside of the system and focus on that. That would be the only thing I can tell you. That's, what I, that's why I do what I do is to inspire people to say, yeah, something's really wrong, but... It's not my fault, it, or it is It is my fault because I can treat, but it's not my fault. Like, I don't have to bear the burdens of it. Yeah, we all fucked up. We all fucked up, but it's okay. We don't have to blame each other. Let's just create something better and get out of it and start living the good way and morally. And that's it. It's very simple. Don't steal. Right, yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. And we were talking again before we started here, um, what I'm working on. And, and just again, just trying to add that value and also... Like, you know, one of the problems is like not joining groups, but at the same time, there, there, there's power in the fact that people collectively are more, are more um, like can affect more change, but it has to be on, on you know. I'm not saying to create an, I'm not saying not to create a network, not to have, pe I'm, I'm just saying don't join, like, you'll see people to like have like a, a professional organization, like a society, right? That's why they create these because then the government can't tell you what to do. So they, they, they are interesting to, curtails, but if you had a healthy government, you wouldn't need to do them in the first place, right? But, or a healthy, uh, I don't like the word government because it literally means mind control, but a healthy system of um, a framework, healthy civilized framework. You don't have to worry about the shit because the government or the that framework wouldn't overstep its reach. But what I'm saying is don't sign up to something where you have to sacrifice what's good and best about you to fit into that group. Otherwise the group won't accept you because you have to be like them. You have to accept their values. You have to take their oaths. That's a no-go. But if you got a 
group of people who are like-minded, hungry go-getters, you want to start business. I'm not saying don't, don't do that. Don't, I'm not saying don't network. I am encouraging that because that saying is true. Your network is your net worth. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you can lose everything. You can lose everything. But if you have a strong network, your boys, all those guys will get you back up in no time. If you don't, you have to start over from square one by yourself. And that sucks. Right. Yeah. I, I'm glad, I'm glad you dove into that distinction there too, because I think there is power in that. I think the people here, it, it's, it's great. It's sometimes it's, it's funny uh, having listened to so many podcasts and then be on this side of it. And um, you know, some things that get lost in translation there, but um, I'm, I'm curious about your opinion on this too, is even if, even if it isn't our fault, we have to view it as our fault. Right. And in terms of like, yes. that's the only way maybe, to go forward. Maybe anymore. not, maybe fault, maybe I'm speaking on it. Maybe fault is not the right, right word. Maybe just responsibility. Like, yes. it's like finding ourselves in a mess and it's like, well, we might not have created the mess. But we got to clean it up. Otherwise, nobody's going to clean it up. We got to right. like, take care of it. Yeah, and with that, that's actually, that's perfect. Yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at there too was like, you know, from again, from your transformation from book one and people who don't know, like go go check out your stuff of like what you even looked like when you were starting this stuff to where you are now, um, I think it's pretty phenomenal. But you, you obviously under that, understand that that point of like life has to have contention so what's your view on all this stuff that's going on and like the way that everything that you've studied over your past um you know your literally your entire work is that there for a reason like is it is the reason to have this contention in, in life or is it like, like a, a mechanism of the creation well it might be I, i'm i'm not i'm not the authority on it it looks like it's it looks like it's there based on our nature it looks like things are always going to end up the way they are. It's just, we're in a time now where it's like, because of the technological introduction of it, it's like, unlike anything we've ever seen before at a scale we've never seen before. But if you go back in time, it's always been this way in at least parts of the world. And the question is, can we, can we, can we surmount this? Can we actually get to a point where like, would we be this fucked up if our education system wasn't so poor, if we were teaching this stuff early on, or maybe if we just weren't teaching this, right? Like maybe you don't need to teach people about what is, you just don't need to teach them about fan. You don't need to teach them about fictional history, right? Cause all the Bible is, is essentially Lord of the Rings in a different era. And now people 2000 years later are like, well, this is, this happened, you know? I'm descended from Gandalf. I have a right to rule you. So it's like, if you could just not teach that, or, you know, you don't need to necessarily change the sex ed program, just get rid of it. It's not, it's not something that needs to be taught in school. There's just a lot of stuff that we've gotten way too comfortable that, you know, school itself is, it's worthless because it doesn't, it's, it's, a place you're being taught by people who most of them have not done anything in the real world. So you're spending all this time where you should be learning how to interact with the real world through businesses, starting businesses, you know, learning trades, whatever you're doing in life. Instead, you're in a classroom learning stuff that doesn't matter, that most of it's not even real and never existed, just so they can cultivate a mindset that when you come out of that will be useful for them to plug and play how they want you to fit into society. And you'll never be able to compete with the truly brilliant and the truly, you know, the wealthy because they're wealthy because they are really good at creating systems, really good at creating solutions, you know? And if you know how to do that, you're a threat to them. And so there's a lot of things that, again, it's all about, it. just look at uh, Rockefeller, competition is a sin. He's not alpha male. You look at these people, they're fucking, uh, scrawny little pip squeaks who wouldn't last five minutes in the room with you. So I don't, to, I know this is like a long story, a long way to answer your question. I think it's twofold. I think we have a biological framework and a way of thinking that ends up leading to this and it's insurmountable in that regard. But I also think we can do a lot better and maybe that's not correct. That opinion is not correct. And with a proper system in place that teaches people how to 
be of value and service to others, then we could probably create a much better civilization. Um, but the war thing, I mean, as long as you have these groups, these powerful people, it's like you're, you're, it seems like you're going to get it no matter what, because it's just, you know, what happens is one person will start a business, they'll get really big, someone else will come to compete, and then that, con that eventually pours over into a conflict. And that's what you see it in nations at like a, a grand scale. Someone has resources that the other nation needs or wants, so they get exploited. Someone like England, for example, becomes dependent on China for its tea. You know what I mean? Like there's like, there's so many freaking things that lead to conflicts that sometimes it can be broken down into simple human n needs, right? It's like, I, it's like I, I needed to do this for my own survival. And I don't know if you can get rid of that, but you could definitely, you could definitely make a better system that doesn't deprive people of freedom, that gives them a shot to compete, and that um, lets them keep the fruit of their labors. That's a big thing, you know. It's like I'm not saying it's a system that needs to cater to the unproductive. It just needs to get out of the way of people, so it's not as difficult for them to start something because people being able to start businesses and provide solutions in their local area that leads to employment opportunities for people who maybe don't have that type of, you know, not everybody can start a business. Not everybody's an entrepreneur. There are some people that need to be good workers and that's okay. But the more options there are, the more abilities that they'll have to thrive. And who knows, they might be able to contribute in other ways to society that will, besides just work that, you know, they wouldn't have had that opportunity because they, you know, in this one, they have to work at friggin' some big box store instead of a small business that they could say, hey, I, I really love your business and I, is there something I can do to own a piece of your business? Is there some, some sort of job or I, you know what I mean? Whatever it is and that owner say, yeah, I need you to do social media marketing. Can you learn how to do that or can you do that? Yeah. So that person all of a sudden goes from like a, you know, a warehouse guy to maybe also doing the social media marketing at the end of his day outside of normal hours but he's getting a share of the company or something. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's all these things that can, that people can thrive and find ways to increase their wealth. And they don't have to be the number one guy or the brains behind the operation. It's just a matter of, can we get over these lies? And I can guarantee you, as long as the lies are still in play, then we have no fucking chance. And it's option one. It's always going to be this way because that's all we've ever seen because we've never been able to get over the lies. So Maybe that is like the light at the end of the tunnel, getting over the lies, finally putting the rest. And finally, um, you know, people think that they have a right to claim authority over you based on their descent or their lineage of these fictional characters. Everyone can mock them out of the room instead of genuflecting and giving them that power. Right. Yeah. I've just always thought of that too, is, you know, we do need this contention, but at the same time is like, do we really need this contention? Like, I'm sure if there was, yeah. you know what <laughs> I mean? This like, much? Yeah. Well, cause like, we're always going to find ways to sort of challenge ourselves with, you know, and, and this challenge is quite, quite intense and all that kind of stuff. But I also think that, you know, if, if there wasn't this challenge, we, we would definitely create quite beautiful things. Right. Because it's not, it's not contention in, it's not competition for destruction. It's competition for excellence. You know, I think yes. that's, what, that's what the problem when people think about what you're talking about with masculinity, we're talking about not being emotional, not being, too much in that feminine energy is like, it's not about destruction. It's not about um, aggression. It's about a pursuant of excellence. And who knows where we could be if we, we didn't have these kind of contentions. But I also think that we do need a certain contention at some, at some level. You know, and some people will say that, oh, that's kind of arbitrary. And it's like, take your head out of your ass. If you need, if you're going to be the exception, you have to be exceptional. So Pursuing excellence, people. some people say, oh, that's just so vague, whatever. Well, you have to be excellent at what you do. This, this might not make a lot of money, but I'm fucking excellent at it. I affect people all over the world on every continent. Would not be possible if I wasn't excellent. Do I pursue excellence? No, I, I, pers I but I need to be excellent. You know, I, I need to pursue the best possible way to help others get this information at the least cost to them, spiritually, physically, and financially.
So whatever you do in life, whether it's being a plumber, being a doctor, being, um, you know, a landscaper, it doesn't matter whether you run a beauty salon, whether you're a barber, whether you give massages, whether you do nails, I don't know. You have to be excellent because you have to be better than everybody if you want more business. And that is what vote, that's the vote, that's the exchange. If you're really good, people are gonna come to you and um, they're gonna use your services. If you're not good, then they're not. And if your livelihood is dependent on that, well then you can't slack off, you have to be good. But right now in this current situation, you can be a slack jawed fool that's totally incompetent and propped up by a system that will just take care of you, right? If there's no, th that's what I'm saying. Like whether it's Hollywood, whether it's politics, everybody's being propped up by a system because they played ball. They're not being propped up by loyal fans because they did good work. And if anything goes wrong with them, they're puppet that's so easily replaced that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Whereas the people who are dangerous are the people who have followings, right? That's why someone like an Owen Benjamin can get canceled and be banned from PayPal and Airbnb and all this other shit despite committing no crimes because he has fans, he has a following. He is not a puppet that they can say, okay, goodbye. And then everybody will forget about him. No, he can go to a fucking barn. He can go to a library and sell it out and still do what he, he enjoys and people love him. So this is what I'm saying to people. He doesn't pursue excellence, right? But he's fucking excellent at comedy. So that's what, and I'm, I'm, I'm not correcting, I'm just saying this because I know there's assholes in the comments that are gonna see this and be like, hey Rob said pursue excellence. What the hell does that even mean? You know, just shut up, boy. Just shut up and let people go to work. Because if you're not willing to do the work, get the hell out of the way and stop complaining about the men who are willing to do the work. Because that's why our society is degraded, is these armchair uh, warriors. Always got something to whine about, always got something to say. And when you look at their body of work, what have they done? Jack nothing. Because a guy who's busy on his purpose is not really spending that much time interacting with others on the internet. It's a fact. Unless you're marketing, you know, you're doing, you know, I respond to people on the internet once in a while, but that was a big lesson I had to learn. This is just, the internet is not real life. Don't try to interact with them. They're disrespectful clowns and they are products of a system that has allowed them to beat natural selection and evolution. And that's the problem is we're propping up the worst specimens of our species. And we're destroying the best specimens in wars and everything else rather than, no, we need to be catering behind the best specimens and let the riffraff just, you know, do its thing. Because if you don't support it, it's like a virus or a parasite. If you don't feed it, it goes away. And that's the system. The system is parasitical. And if you don't feed it your consent and your energy, it goes away, it starves. That's why, you know, that's why cleansing is so important. It gets rid of all the bad stuff in your gut and that, that that is very, that is, if you look at it from like the principle of correspondence, that internal world of your digestive system, it's a reflection of the external. Things work the same way. They're self-similar across all scales. Some's on the microcosm, some's on the macrocosm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. And I think that's one of the problems. <laughs> you were even talking about Rockefeller too. I was thinking that as well. When you read some of these books, when you're trying to get on this another path of like, you know, being excellent in your thing, and you go, okay, well, who's excellent? And the same people are propped up are these Rockefellers, and it's you know, think and grow rich and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, man, all of it's kind of all over the place. But I think that that's it's a it's a nice space. I had to read those books too. I had yeah. to read those books like in uh, when I was in financial services, or whatever. And I don't think they're necessarily bad. It's just like again, they're the same people that are propped up to a certain degree, right? It's just it's they it's, want you to think a certain way. Yes. And, and like, can grow rich, how to win friends and influence people. All these, they're all the same. They're good. They're good books, but they're written by people who are not part of the solution. Right. And I, I do think that that is honestly, that that's, that's what I'm trying to transition into is the idea of like, listen, okay, well, obviously there's a way that there is 
there, there is a way to prosper. There is a way. There, the solution can't be for all of us to sit behind computers and bitch and moan and complain about things until you know all of the, all of these systems that they want to introduce are finally in place. So let's figure out what that is and let's get let's get so successful at what we want to do and so independent and decentralized from their system that we just don't even care anymore. And I think that like the infighting and all that kind of stuff is just so um, detrimental to that kind of idea. But, you know, these, the, the alternative to that is, is getting pretty grim to look at. Well, that's why you got to, um, the key to that is going to be in passive income streams. Because as long as you're an employer, I'm sorry, an employee, as long as you're dependent on a system then you're kind of like i don't want to say a slave because it's like it's the wrong it's the wrong word but like if you're scared of getting fired then that job or your boss or whatever can treat you any way they want and you kind of have to decide whether okay i don't have to take this but if i don't take it what does that aftermath look like and if it looks like you not being able to afford rent and pay your bills and whatever else then it's like well I know I don't have to take it, but I need to survive and I don't want to get fired. So I'm going to have to take it, you know? So it's like passive income. Like for me, I work for free right now. I, I work every day researching and writing, and I'm going to have at least one more book to publish this year. And no one pays me. No one supports me. I don't have a following. I don't even have an audience. I just do it because it's the thing that I see needs to be done. And that leads to passive income because when I go on a podcast, right, go on like a crow or something, the sales pop or word of mouth, those books will be selling every day around the world. And I don't have to do anything because I already did the work years ago and I'm just starting to get rewarded for it now. And so, you know, that's another option for people who see this, who actually have audiences. You can have an Amazon affiliate link and just, promote my work through your affiliate links so that when your audience buys my books, you get a piece of that pie. So going back to what we were talking about in the beginning and somewhat now, it's, it's about creating win-win-win situations where everybody who's involved with you is winning and you don't have to actually sacrifice anything to help them win. You know, that's how, um, that's how like people become successful in affiliate marketing or these multi-level uh, marketing schemes, well, they're not really, they're, they're systems designed to help people win for helping you win. And you just have to find ways to do that in whatever profession you're in. And that's, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in the hospitality industry or if you're in the construction industry, if you can find a way to give people a reason to choose to work for you over others, and be loyal and work hard and be reliable. That's that you've won because right now we're in a time where people, um, there's like labor shortages because people not only do they not want to work, which is understandable given that the government can come in and shut it down. It's like, why do I want to go invest in doing all this shit to only be shut down for on the whim of some politician and a scared populace that watches the media? Um, but there's also people who just don't have the professionalism to work hard anymore because what they're making is not really worth it to them because it doesn't really increase their style, their, like their ability to live. So it's like, why am I going to go work hard for you when I can't even afford to have a family and a home on this salary or whatever? So why, why would I do that? It's like, if I'm, if I'm not going to be able to afford what I want in life and I can either work bare minimum to get by or work hard for you. Why would I choose working hard for you? So you have to find ways. If you can't afford to pay people hourly, you have to find ways as a business owner to incentivize them to work for you. Uh, you giving them shares of your company, whatever that is, that's up to you. But the old model of how we've been doing business for the last couple centuries, it's over, man. It's We are so far gone. And who knows what the monetary system is going to look like in the coming decade because, it, I mean, it doesn't look good, man. It looks like we're going into a centralized digital ether cryptocurrency stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not to end on a uh, sort of like grim note or a kind of be on a grim note, but uh, you know, at the same time, you have to be very, very realistic of where you are so that you can find a plan to move forward into. And I, I couldn't agree more in, 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 in uh, finding ways of leverage 
and to, to leverage your time, leverage your work and incentivize people to work for you or work with you in, in any sort of way like that. Um, but yeah, man, it's, I, I do think that what your work does is open people's eyes to really, really get laser sharp and in a very, very fine tuned attention to when lies are happening and then knowing what to do once you see that. So, I mean, I, first of all, I can't just, I can't thank you enough for your work for one, uh, two, even coming on this podcast, uh, you know, over the past year of starting this up, I've had some really, really incredible connections and um, you're, you're one of the highest on that uh, truly, man. And um, I'm just curious as to what, what you have, you, you're obviously, we said you were working on book five, which might be in two parts, um, but you really yeah. talk a bit more about that and then what else you might have going on. Yeah. So um, another thing you always hear in these spaces is people bitching about, oh, well, there's no good like fiction or entertainment and stuff. It's like, well, I've written a fantasy series that I had to stop because I kind of got canceled. That's my own fault for uh, interacting with people online that I shouldn't have been interacting with. But I stopped that and started writing Spirit World because uh, the situation was getting so bad. But uh, one of them, oh, here we go. This would be book one. So this series is called The Tale of Onora, and it's basically real man's fantasy, gritty. And um, and so basically it's like uh, some of my favorite stories incorporated because they encode some of the stuff that we're talking about, namely like The Legend of Zelda, uh, Assassin's Creed, uh, The Witcher, Elder Scrolls. A lot of my favorite uh, inspirations for, um, in, in my life for like these, these, these worlds of like these amazing worlds of like conflict and all this other stuff. I did that and I dressed the allegory of my life up into it, but I'm still at the beginning phase of that series. Like I've published three books. And so I have a lot more to say on that, but I'm not going to do that if it doesn't pay. So if people want to support that work, um, what happened is, you'll go to the landing page and you'll see all bad reviews on Amazon first, if you're in America, because what they did is they left fake reviews and then voted them all up. So that's all anyone sees to basically stop the sale. Um, but it still has like four stars, or whatever, it's still, you know, it's still surviving, but uh, support that because the more money I make with that, the more likely I'll be able to do my, my own series. But right? if you don't have to be dependent on, the banks, you know, for making films, you've talked to this Remember, Actually, that, actually I think that's where I saw this last. You, people were asking you about film and you're like, dude, films are expensive. You gotta pay for permits, crafty. You gotta pay for makeup. You gotta pay for all these people to be on location with you or you have to find people that are willing to work as local hires. It's like a, it's a really expensive process, especially if you're using unionized people Then you have to pay uh, union wages. So, it's expensive. So that's why it's hard to make this stuff and make it good. So if you want to support me in that regard, support my fiction work. Um, my latest book is called The Holy Sailors. It's Spirit World Book Five. And that is going to be a um, continuation of this stuff, but it's showing uh, how it's possible. We have a universal system of language, symbolism, and weird rites, architecture, stuff that shouldn't be there based on the literal narrative that they told us, which is totally bunk. Well, they've lied about that to preserve mosaic history. But if you actually learn the truth, everything is way, way, way older than mosaic history. And that's what they're worried about. So that's why they have to either cover up or after a while, forget about. So even if they knew how, even if they knew, you know, about these other civilizations that were already extant, in like Egypt or Peru or all this stuff, they wouldn't know how to explain how they did certain stuff because it's too far removed from when it was done. So whether the information was lost or not, it had to be covered up when people originally knew about it. And the other reason these things had to be covered up is for these powerful empires, they didn't want their own populace to know about them. For example, the Phoenicians, Carthaginians, all these empires along the, the Mediterranean, but they don't want people to know about Britannia, Ireland. They don't want them to know about that stuff because they're worried their own population. They don't want them to know about the Americas because then their own population will go just like Britain's population left. 
start something better and go for greener pastures. So there's a lot of cool stuff that uh, we don't know. And there's a lot of stuff that people have talked about, but they've never proved it with language or symbolism. And that's what I'm going to try to do with book four and five. I'm oh, sorry, five and six, if, I, if there is a six, because I'm over about 300 pages now and I don't publish long books. It's like 200, circa 200 to 250 is like where I want to go max. So if it gets up to like 400 pages, then I'm going to publish two books. But other than that, yeah, just continuing uh, doing this. And if anybody sees this and you have a good show that has an audience, feel free to reach out to me. My social media plat uh, platforms are just my name at YouTube, Dylan Sicocio. That's uh, D-Y-L-A-N space S-A-C-C-O-C-C-I-O. On Twitter, I am at Tale of Onora, O-N-O-R-A. At TikTok, I am at Spirit World. And at Instagram, I am at A underscore God's Acre. And I'm so censored on there that it doesn't matter. But uh, generally, my Instagram handle is going to be like the latest handle of the latest Spirit World book. So when the Holy Sailors is ready, I'm going to change my Instagram handle to the Holy Sailors if it's available. But if it's not available, I'll have to think of something else. But uh, that's that's where I'm at. And uh, Rob, it's a pleasure as always. And, uh, you know, look forward to the next one. Yeah, man, I can't thank you enough. I um, Maybe just to wrap it up, I usually, I usually try to ask this question to... Um, to a lot of people is something that I ask myself is, you know, how can I add value, become resilient and have, you know, the courage to kind of keep going and all that kind of stuff and really just, just, you know, be me, but have the value, the courage and resiliency to keep trudging forward. And for you, which I, which I love too, is how to, you know, not be attached to emotionalism. Like you're saying, do you have anything, any parting words, maybe something like one or two little quick tips that people can actually implement in their lives? Yeah. To yeah. Yeah, so uh, I also have another book called Get Mad or Get Realistic, which we've talked about. But one of the things that really helps me when my life is like basically turning into a nightmare, I mean, I, it got to the point where I'm like, I am in a nightmare. Like this, this world, everything that I try to avoid, not that I try to avoid, but like the consequences, the way my life's played out, it's always the exact opposite of what I intended. Like the very thing that I would be not wanting to happen to me happens to me and there got to a point where in order to not be phased by it I just had to accept we're in a nightmare and learn how to enjoy the nightmare so if you're having a nightmare in a dream and you can recognize that it's a nightmare all of a sudden you won't be as scared in the nightmare and you might be able to say well I can actually have some fun in this nightmare now that I know that I'm dreaming and it's not real I'm not saying that's how the world works or how life works but I say Embrace the fear. If you're scared, it doesn't matter. I'm here for the nightmare. And embrace your punishment. If you can, so sometimes you can trick yourself and say, well, maybe this is happening to you because I'm being punished, whatever. Okay, so be it. I'm getting punished. I'm going to accept my punishment and then I'm going to go on with my life. Whereas if you're just like, why is all this bad stuff happening to me? I was so good. I didn't deserve this. Well, you're going to be in victim consciousness. And it's going to stay with you a lot longer than just say, yep, give me my lashings and I'll be on my way. Yep. Pay my fine. I'll be on my way. And just say, embrace it. Just, you know, fuck it. I'm here for the nightmare. All glory to God. And there's nothing you can do. The adversity for me, it's like a mundane adversary where it's like, it's just been so historically, like, I'm just, I've basically just failed at everything I've tried to do one thing after another, but I've still somehow managed to like create something and produce something. So it's like, even though I'm like a failure by, you know, like if you were to measure it by like financial, whatever other metrics that like our society values, I'm a total failure. But in terms of what I'm able to produce, I produce content. And so sometimes you just have to say, well, if this was making millions of dollars, would I still be a failure? And if the answer is no, then okay, well, then what you're doing is probably pretty good. There's just no market for it. It doesn't mean you're a failure. You just, you know, in, in a real failure, it's just not trying because you're never going to know if something's going to work or not unless you try. You're never going to know if that girl is interested in you or not unless you talk to her. You're never going to know if um, you're good enough to do something unless you attempt to do it. And a lot of people use fear and whatever else to say, I'm not going to do that. 
that's kind of like the whole black community uh, black pill community whatever the hell it's called they're just like oh everything's too far gone it's too i don't know yeah it's too women are this women are that uh, i just don't need, no it's like dude no women are the way they've always been we just live in an environment that enables some of those exploit some of those features or those you know things that make them behave a certain way and it's not in your best interest but you just got to be realistic about it and that's all you don't need to get mad it's not it's not about um rollo tomasi's latest book is really good i don't like the pill things but red pill is a thing right when people say red pill they know what you mean and he said the whole point of the red pill is not so that you hate women it's so that you don't hate them for what they can never be to you Wow. And that's the problem. That's good. That goes with idealism. A lot of times our beliefs, they're beliefs. They're not knowledge. They're what you think of the world, not what the world actually works like. So if you could just observe reality and base your decision-making and judgments on how people actually behave versus how you think they behave or want them to behave, you'll have more realistic interactions and you won't have ex expectations that can never be met. And that's often where a lot of our suffering comes from is we have expectations that we never reach and anything below that is like a disappointment. And I would encourage people to not have that or to not like install that in their, their firmware. I love it, man. I love it. I love the get mad or get realistic mindset, all that kind of stuff. And one thing I was listening to right before we hopped on as well was, I cannot lose if I do not quit, right? If I do not quit, I cannot lose and all that kind of stuff too, man. I, I love it. Um, You're going to learn something. You're going to learn something and grow either way. So like you talk to people who have uh, become successful, they failed at a lot of shit before they, you know, it's like sometimes they've started like five to 10 businesses before they had one good one. They lost a lot of money. So it's like, yeah, just, just keep trying, shoot your shot. You know, it's like those people... Some of those people like, yeah, they've, they've made the most points, but they've also missed the most shots. They're just shooters. They take the shot and they're not, they're not like, oh, I missed that game winner. I'll never take another game winner. No, give me the fucking ball. And they're just like, they don't, short-term memory, give me the rock. Just, just understand that failure is part of it. Even a good baseball player strikes out, you know, one out of what, two out of three times or doesn't get out to like, if you get on base one third of the time, that's like a good average. So you know, live your life like that. If, if you succeed, like if you try to make passive income on 10 different things, not all at once, but one or two of them all of a sudden provides you passive income, that's a success because now you have passive income. Just because you failed in eight other endeavors doesn't mean that those, you know, and eventually you get enough of that going. It's like the, the, the pennies in the bucket. You know, eventually it has an impact on your life and it allows you to have other opportunities. The problem we have today is most of us just don't want to do the work. And I forget where I saw this, but like, I think just a lot of people just want to be like TikTok stars, YouTube stars. They don't actually want to produce anything of value. They just want attention and an audience. And I think they're making up for maybe like they had a bad upbringing or something and they want love. Like maybe their parents didn't love them the way they, you know, so they're looking like, well, if I could be famous, if I could do this, I'll get that attention. And that'll, people will love me. That'll make up for my not getting love. And I'm not saying they actually think like that, but I think subconsciously there is that idealism. And that's why people don't understand how like famous people could be like depressed or whatever. It's like, just cause you get fame and success, it doesn't mean that your problems go away. You just have all new problems. You know, your circumstances change and how you deal with that is gonna dictate how fruitful your life is. And uh, yeah, that's it, just keep trying. Who cares, take the shot. You're just gonna die anyway. Fucking might as well take a couple shots before that happens. Because you might not have as much time as you think you do. That's the one thing is, you know, tomorrow's not promised. So if you have those opportunities, I'm not saying you have to go out of your way, but like, let's say, you know, for women, right? Let's say a woman makes eye contact to you and smiles. Don't just say hi and walk past her or smile back. Fucking say something to her. That's what she wants you to do. And a lot of you now are too afraid to do this stuff. And it's like if, um, you know, someone's talking about a business opportunity or you're with someone 
you can, it's not needy if you're like, what can I do to increase, like add value to your business? Cause I want to work with you. Like you're freaking awesome, dude. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing wrong with like approaching people like that and talking about opportunities. In fact, I bet there's a lot of people that are like, I'm, I wonder why I've done so much. I'm so baffled by why nobody reaches out to me for opportunities. It's because everybody's kind of scared, but also everybody's in this weird ego thing where they think they're better than they actually are. And the world should just come crawling to their doorstep and, you know, will you do this for us? You're so amazing. And it's not how life works. <laughs> you got to get out there. Just like people who say like, oh, you're like a salesman, dude. You're just, you don't have any credibility because you're just selling your books. Yeah. Because if I don't, nobody else does. If I, if I just did nothing and didn't share my work, nobody else would in a capacity that sells it. So if you want me to stop being a salesman, make me a fucking multimillionaire, make spirit world sell a million copies. And then I won't have to waste any more time online promoting them anymore because I can just sit back in my place and do other endeavors. I'm down with that's a great deal. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. No, I love it, man. I think it's, I think it's great. It's, it's interesting. Anytime I ask a question, it's just like, it can go on and on. I love it. Um, I really enjoy talking to you, man. Uh, really grateful for your time, for everything that you've done, your books that you write and everything like that. Everyone who's interested, it's all going to be in the description. Check them out. Uh, Tale of Anora, the um, fantasy series, Spirit World, Get Mad or Get Realistic, all that stuff. All the ways to find them will be in the description there, as well as ways to support this show. Please click on those because it helps me bring people like Dylan to you guys. Um, again, Dylan, can't thank you enough, man. And uh, hopefully we'll get you on here pretty soon. Yeah, thank you as well, Rob. It was great talking to you.